Anyway, we're going to be talking about a particular philosopher today, often considered the greatest American philosopher on the contemporary scene, Saul Kripke, and in the background of that, the 1970s. Now, in some ways, I have a lot of fondness for the 1970s. I was in college during the 70s. I got married during the 70s. It was a good time. Yeah. Um, I've got the charger, but the, the problem is I can't plug in both the display and the charger at the same time. <laughs> so I can charge this if and only if I'm not showing you anything. Um, so, yeah, I did think to bring that, but it's not as much good as I thought it would be. This was the Rolling Stones retrospective greatest hits of the 70s album, <laughs> sucking in the 70s. <laughs> and indeed, for a lot of us who lived through the 70s, it felt like a time of massive sucking. Um, however, it had its good aspects as well as its bad aspects, and we're going to look at both of those. Now, it was a time of ups and downs. A U.S. president won re-election in a landslide in 1972, only to resign less than two years later. Um, U.S. troops left Vietnam in 1973, and in 1973, thinking the war had been won, only to have Saigon fall just two years later. The U.S. and the Soviet Union signed the Helsinki Accords. They promised non-aggression and respect for human rights. But then, just within three years, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Also, the U.S., under President Jimmy Carter, sought to craft a more positive image of the United States in international affairs. But on the other hand, he gave tacit support to a revolution in Iran that placed in, in power a theocratic, violent, and profoundly anti-American regime that promptly seized the American embassy and took its employees hostage. So it was a difficult decade. Now, the decade of ups and downs nevertheless did, from the point of view of our whole course, involve something very important. Normativity made a major return. The gap between is and ought somehow seemed to shrink. And by 1980s, leaders really across the ideological spectrum of all parties were talking in frankly normative terms, talking about ideals, talking about morality in serious ways. And so there was a kind of revival of moral concepts, of normative language, of good and evil, right and wrong, in a way that had really fallen out of fashion for decades. So in a certain sense, the 70s, although they were a time of ups and downs and a lot of difficulties, nevertheless, and a lot of terrible styles, too, I've got to say. I, I thought I would show you for grins a photograph of me from the 70s. And then I decided not to do it because it's too embarrassing. Um, this, well, not, anyway, I won't say any more. It's just the fashions were sort of inexplicable. But among them were aughts. Aughts were back in style. Well, I want to start by talking about Saul Kripke's views, and if we have time, we'll start looking today at the history of the 1970s. We'll finish that off next time. But Saul Kripke is somebody who really changed the philosophical landscape in fundamental ways. Here is one photograph of him talking to Hilary Putnam. We'll get to that later. Here he is giving a lecture. Here he's at the beach. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Kripke made a big name for himself in 1959 with a paper called A Completeness Theorem in Modal Logic, in which he used Leibniz's idea of possible worlds to explain the concept of necessity. Leibniz had said that necessity is truth in all possible worlds. And Kripke took that idea and developed it in a highly mathematical way to give a theory of possibility and necessity. He did it in a, in a distinctly 20th century way. It wasn't really quite necessity as truth in all worlds, but in all the accessible worlds, all the worlds that you could actually see or imagine or conceive of or whatever the proper relation is here from the point of view of your own world. So it went along with and was almost contemporaneous with the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics and physics. And the idea was think of our worlds just one of many possible worlds. This one happens to be actual, but the others are ways things could be or could have been. And something is necessarily true if and only if it's true in all of those worlds, at least all of the worlds that are relevant to the evaluation of such claims in our world. At the time that paper came out, he was still a teenager. He was a high school student in Omaha. Um, but in 1970, but, and by the way, Kripke is sort of an amazing case in a variety of ways. He went to Harvard, he was a student of Quine, graduated with an undergraduate degree and was immediately hired as a professor with just a bachelor's degree. Um, at first by Rockefeller University in New York and then at Princeton. Um, later he moved to Hebrew University in Jerusalem and now he teaches at the City University of New York. And all that without ever having gone to graduate school. So he was just immediately recognized as a genius. In 1970, he published Naming and Necessity, uh, a series of talks he gave at Princeton. 
Uh, and then, a few years later, outline of a theory of truth, which had a, a comprehensive theory of the paradoxes. And then after that, Wittgenstein on rules and private language. Since then, he's been giving great many talks and publishing actually very little. Um, he has a whole box filled with talks <laughs> that are brilliant, uh, and few of which have ever appeared in any form in print. In any case, we're going to talk mostly, yeah, I know that. We're going to talk <laughs> mostly about his views as developed in naming necessity, which first appeared actually as part of this collection and then came out as a book. Well, let me take you back to Bertrand Russell on descriptions. You might remember that as the most boring and irrelevant lecture of the entire semester. <laughs> a lot of you were thinking, why, do we, why are we studying this talk about the present king of France? This doesn't make any sense. But remember, according to Russell, descriptions like that, the present king of France, the telephone, the typewriter, the A-track player, <laughs> to use something from the 70s, the iPad, all of those things don't simply refer to an object in the world. Instead, sentences containing those are actually general statements about the world. The present king of France is bald, asserts that there is one and only one present king of France, and that person is bald. So it's false. If I say the iPad is running out of power, that means there is one and only one iPad, and it's running out of power. Now, obviously, this isn't quite right. There's more than one iPad in the universe. <laughs> um, so we have to understand this as sort of relevant to some particular domain of discourse that we're talking about. In this case, well, maybe the set of things I'm demonstrating or the things close to me or the things in this room or something. But in any case, these things are really general statements about the world. And as general statements about the world, they involve concepts. They involve terms like typewriter or iPad or present, king, France, and so on. There are concepts that lie between us and reality. So we perceive reality, we can talk about it and so on, but through this film of concepts, through this film of things that are our, 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 that are our own mental constructions. And so we don't relate to things in the world directly, according to Russell. We really, at best, only relate to things, quote unquote, directly when we use terms like this and that. But even then, we're not referring to items in the world. We're referring to our own mental contents. Now, here's a picture of that that I showed you under postmodernism, but applies just as well to Russell, in a sense. I can't talk about the pigeon. I have to talk about, well, at least not directly, it's filtered through concepts, such as pigeon. Now, he thinks that's true of proper names as well. Traditionally, logicians haven't thought that. They've thought statements involving proper names are singular expressions. They aren't like some or all type of statements, or there is exactly one or any of that sort of thing. They think they relate to the world directly. So if I say Nixon resigned, I'm referring directly to Nixon. Aristotle was an ancient Greek philosopher. I'm referring directly to Aristotle. It's about the thing. But actually, Russell denies that. He says, no, all of those are really disguised descriptions. And so they don't actually connect to objects directly. They, too, connect only by way of concepts. They really make general statements about the world. There is, an only, there is one and only one person who, well, what? <laughs> was Aristotle, who, was, who did the Aristotelian things, who Aristotle, uh, as Klein at one point puts it. OK, so according to this view, proper names really abbreviate descriptions. To use a proper name is really to have a description, or maybe a set of descriptions in your mind, for that thing, Aristotle. For example, if I say, who is Aristotle, what's the answer? What's your answer? Might be different for different people. Who is Aristotle? Philosopher. A philosopher. OK. <laughs> That's not very specific. <laughs> but we might say Aristotle is the philosopher. Actually, that's exactly the way people in the Middle Ages referred to him. Aristotle was just the philosopher. It's like none of the others really matter. There's only one that anybody worries about. That's Aristotle. That was their idea. Um, you might say, well, that's pretty vague. But how about the most famous ancient Greek philosopher, or at least the, the most famous student of Plato, or something like that, you can have a description in mind that picks out the object uniquely. Now, a philosopher, the philosopher, doesn't do that, but we might make it more specific. At least we'd have a set of descriptions in some way that does that. Well, OK, so Aristotle might be short for Plato's most famous student, or the tutor of Alexander the Great, or the last great philosopher of antiquity, or some combination of those descriptions. Now, I think it's interesting that actually most of the time, and it's a point Kripke makes a lot, most of the time people operate with names even though they can't give anything like that description. For example, who was Aristotle? A philosopher. Well, there are lots of philosophers, right? That doesn't pick out any object unique. If I say, actually, this is one of Kripke's examples. If I say, who was Richard Feynman? 
Does anybody know? Yeah. Physicist. A physicist. physicist. Good. A physicist. But that too is not uniquely picking out anybody, right? There are lots of physicists in the world. And most people might know that Feynman is a, a physicist. But on the other hand, they might not know how to define him uniquely or characterize him uniquely. The same with Aristotle. The same with lots of people. Now, we might think, well, yeah, there's some particular image we have in mind. For example, here is Aristotle walking with Plato in Raphael's famous painting, The School of Athens. So maybe that's the image you have in your mind. That's what's really going on. Or maybe it's Aristotle teaching Alexander. This is Alexander the Great. That's Aristotle, his tutor. Or maybe it's He's the greatest, the last great philosopher of antiquity. Here he is being great, <laughs> thinking deeply. Similarly with contemporary names, Richard Nixon might be short for the man who investigated Alger Hiss or Eisenhower's vice president, <clears throat> the man who lost to JFK in 1960, the man elected president in 1968, the man re-elected in 1972, and so on. All of those might be taken as descriptions of Nixon. So we might have this image or this one or this one. See, I wasted a lot of time this morning gathering up these images, <laughs> or this one, or whatever. Now, Kripke points out, look, not only is this not usually true, we use lots of names without being able to give uniquely identifying descriptions, but also, it's in a way worse. If that's right, then there are certain things that ought to be necessarily true, and they ought to be true a priori. Now, to explain what I mean by saying that, let's talk about the distinction in general. Avicenna is really perhaps the first philosopher who came up with the idea of distinguishing two kinds of statements. He said cognition can be analyzed into two kinds. One can be known through the intellect. It's known necessarily by reasoning through itself. It's known by reflection, in other words. The other kind is that known by intuition, experience, that is. Well, whatever is known by intellect should be based on something which is known prior to the thing. When that was translated into Latin, the term was a priori. And so philosophers ever since have talked about certain judgments we make being a priori. That is to say, in some sense, prior to, independent of experience. So there may be certain things I can know just independently of experience of the world. What would be something like that? Can you think of anything I might be able to know without experience of the world, but just through re rational reflection? You need to eat? Like you need to eat. Well, is that something like that? Could I just think, hmm, I've been plunked down in this human body, hmm and just by reasoning alone, realize I need to eat? Probably not, right? I have to have the experience of hunger. Yeah? Maybe you could be self-aware. Ooh, I could be self-aware. Maybe I am. I think. You know, that's, that's Descartes' answer in part. I think. I am. Anything that thinks exists and so on. Maybe things like that I could recognize a priori without experience. Can you think of anything else? Yeah? Uh, would being, like, feeling your environment be something? Like, if you're cold, that's not, or is that experience itself? Ah, okay, good. Being cold, that's, you know, sometimes it's cold. That's not something I could know a priori. That requires experience. So, actually, Avicenna gives this example of the flying man. I think, for our purposes, the best equivalent to that is to think about somebody in a sensory deprivation tank. Imagine having been in a sensory deprivation tank your whole life. Is there anything you could know despite that? Well, Presumably in this tank, you're not cold, you're not hot, so you wouldn't know things like that. You might be able to know you exist. Maybe by purely reasoning, you could know that 2 plus 2 is 4, or something like that. So maybe mathematics is like this. Things that are true by definition, if you somehow know a language, <laughs> despite having been in this sensory deprivation tank, maybe you could know bachelors are unmarried, some things like that. But it's going to be pretty limited. The other things are a posterior. They depend on experience. They're the things you know from experience, like that you need to eat or that sometimes it gets cold, or that there are people in the room, etc., etc. Most of our knowledge of the world is a posteriori. It comes from experience. But there might be some things that are a priori and can be known independently of experience. Well, <coughs> Hume puts it this way. The a posteriori judgments he calls matters of fact. They depend on experience. We learn about them from experience. But there are certain other things he describes as relations of ideas. He says those can be known by a mere operation of thought. And so what he calls relations of ideas are these a priori judgments. Now suppose I am operating with the definition that Aristotle was Plato's most famous student. Then I should be able to know something about Aristotle a priori, independently of experience, namely what? Could you restate the question? 
Yes. Let, let, the fact that I made it about Aristotle makes it hard. Let's make it about me. <laughs> okay? Who am I? Okay, the professor. Now, <laughs> good. That's your definition, definite description of me, the professor. So, if that's your understanding, is there anything you know about me a priori, independently of experience? Some of you are shaking your heads, no. You're smart. Are all professors smart? You're educated? I'm educated. Well, ah, is it true by definition that professors are educated? Maybe. Here's one you know, right? That I'm the professor. <laughs> That's just part of what defines Dan Bonavac for you. And so, that I'm the professor is something you should be able to know a priori. Then anything that's true by definition of professors would be, like, I don't know, they profess, <laughs> right? They teach. They do what professors do. So maybe those things, maybe their qualifications, like you have to be educated. And if those things are things you could know a priori, then those things, too, you would know a priori about me. So there might be things like that. Well, there's also the distinction we should... Actually, I've already talked about this. I'm going to skip it, given that we're on low, low on battery. Yeah. Let's just jump to this. Anyway, if it's true that we define Aristotle, Nixon, Dan Bonavac, and so on in terms of descriptions, then sentences like this, Aristotle was Plato's most famous student, or Aristotle tutored Alexander the Great, or Aristotle was the last great philosopher of antiquity, should be necessary, right? They should be necessarily true, because it's just the definition of Aristotle you use that Aristotle was Plato's most famous student, or whatever. These would be just true by definition. They would also be a priori, since you don't really require experience to know them. They're things that you could just know independently of experience, just by knowing the meaning of the term Aristotle. If Aristotle just means the tutor of Alexander the Great, then you should know by definition that Aristotle tutored Alexander the Great. That would be a necessary truth. No one would count as Aristotle unless that was the case. But Kripke says, look, that's obviously wrong. <laughs> Is it a necessary truth that Aristotle was the last great philosopher of antiquity? Well, no, right? <coughs> Maybe he wouldn't have gone into philosophy at all. Maybe he just wrote, in some other possible world, right, the scientific treatises. Or maybe he just became a slacker and didn't do anything at all. He might not have ever done any philosophy. And so there's, surely this isn't a necessary truth about Aristotle. Also, what if he had tutored Alexander, and Alexander had been so inspired by philosophy that he had decided to become a great philosopher? Then maybe Alexander the Great would be the last great philosopher of antiquity. Right? Instead of being a conqueror, maybe he'd be remembered as the guy who was Aristotle's most famous student. Well, he probably still is, but, I mean, <laughs> the greatest philosopher who was Aristotle's student. Well, the same is true of the other possible definitions. Is it a necessary truth that Aristotle was Plato's most famous student? Well, no. He might never have studied with Plato at all, right? That's sort of a historical accident. And Aristotle might not be remembered at all. In fact, we remember Aristotle really through a series of remarkable historical accidents. His a lot of his works were lost. Some of those that were, we retain were actually stored for more than a century in a Turkish basement. Somebody went down and opened this old moldy box and started looking through it and thought, what are these things? Took it to somebody and they said, these are the works of Aristotle. They've been missing for centuries. Okay? If that person hadn't done that, if they had just, I don't know, hired somebody else to come and clean out the basement, those things would have been thrown away and nobody would know who Aristotle was. So. That really, too, is a historical accident. Well, the same thing is true of Nixon. Suppose we define Nixon as the guy who was elected president in 1968. Then that Nixon was elected president in 1968 would be a necessary truth, but it's obviously not. He could have lost that election. So all of these things are actually contingent. They're not necessary. Moreover, they're a posteriori. You actually have to learn American history to find out that Nixon won the 1968 election. It's not something you know just by knowing the term Nixon. And the same thing is true about Aristotle. We don't know any of that just because we know how to use the term Aristotle. So none of those are a priori. Here is Kripke's positive theory. He says names are rigid designators. What does that mean? They pick out the same thing in every possible world. Okay? Descriptions aren't like that. The present king of France denotes nothing in our world, but presumably there are other possible worlds where it denotes something, right? What about the guy who won the presidential election in 1968? In this world, that refers to Richard Nixon, but it could refer to Hubert Humphrey in a very nearby <coughs> possible world. It could refer to George Wallace in a more distant possible world. It could refer to, I don't know, who was alive in 1968, who 
it could refer to Elvis, right, in some more distant fossil world, and so on. And so, descriptions pick out different objects in different possible worlds, typically. However, proper names, Kripke says, aren't like that. If I describe a counterfactual scenario about Nixon, I'm imagining that Nixon was that person. If I say, suppose Nixon had lost the 1968 election, I'm supposing that Richard Nixon lost it, not something else. In fact, if I define him as the guy who won the 1968 election, then that would be like saying, suppose that the very same person both won and lost the 1968 election, which would be absurd. And so, Actually, when I imagine some other scenario involving Nixon, it involves Nixon. The word Richard Nixon, <laughs> the name Richard Nixon, refers to the same object in every possible world. So here's a way of thinking about that. A description bounces around like this red line. Here I'm imagining nine and the number of planets. Okay, the number of planets, that's something that varies in different possible worlds. In some it's nine, and some it's actually in the actual world, I don't know what it is because Pluto's status is controversial. Pluto used to be considered a planet. Now it's been demoted to be a, a big ball of ice. Um, but I, you know, hey, I don't know what to say about that. In any event, <laughs> the number of planets, that bounces around from possible world to possible world. But nine, that denotes the same number in every possible world. OK. Now, here is his theory of how names actually work. It's called the causal theory of names. Here's the picture. Somebody gives somebody a name. For example, Richard Nixon is born. He is baptized, baptized as Richard Milhouse Nixon. Okay, his parents give him that name. And then, well, it gets passed on. This is an initial baptism, Kripke says, where, and forget the religious overtones of that, the idea is just there's some kind of social ceremony where we give things names. And so, for people, that's kind of highly stylized, it's legal, it's got all sorts of ramifications, but lots of things aren't like that. If I name my cat, I don't actually have to you know, do anything to name my cat Zadok. Um, I can just start calling that cat Zadok, and it gets, you know, I don't have to file legal papers. There's no official ceremony. I don't have to break a bottle of champagne over the cat's head and say, you are now Zadok. <laughs> but if it's a ship, right, I have to do that, and so on. Well, anyway, there's some kind of ceremony like that, and you name an object, a person, or a thing, or whatever, an animal, in which the object takes on that name. Nixon's parents, for example, name him Richard Milhouse Nixon. <coughs> okay, and there's Nixon as a small child. He's that one. <laughs> and then, what happens? Other people to learn to use the name from the parents, from other people who know how to use the name. And so, this gets passed on through a causal chain. The parents say, let's name him Richard. And then other people say, what's the baby's name? Ah, Richard. And they start describing the baby as Richard, and so on and so forth. And so it spreads gradually through this kind of causal chain, and it can go down through centuries. Presumably, somebody at some point named Aristotle, Aristotle, or actually something close to that. I mean, it was Greece, right? So something like Aristoteles. <laughs> and that got passed down over time and goes, gets rendered into various languages in different ways. But the idea is that receivers of the name learn how to use it from somebody who already knows how to use it, intending to refer to the same thing. That last clause is important. If I name my cat Aristotle, then I'm not intending to refer to the ancient Greek philosopher. Or once when I was in grad school, a friend of mine sewed me this owl and called it Aristotle, okay, and gave it to me for my birthday. The owl was not an ancient Greek philosopher, right? <laughs> so they weren't intending to use it in the same way. But that's the general idea of the causal theory. So what's the point of it? Well, there is nothing conceptual involved in this. There is no sort of wall of concepts separating me from the world. Actually, there are just causal links. There is a causal connection when somebody initially baptizes the baby Richard Milhouse Nixon and associates that name with that thing in the world. And then there are causal relationships about how the use of the name is passed on to other people. But all of that involves direct causal links to the world. Well, direct or indirect, it might be through many different sort of uh, parts of the chain, but it's all causal connections. It is not conceptual connections. And so in between me and reality, there's a direct link, okay? And it's one we make every day. Anytime I talk about Nixon, I'm making a direct reference to Richard Nixon. <clears throat> if I talk about Aristotle, I'm directly referring to Aristotle. If you talk about Dan Bonnevac, you're directly referring to me. There's no concept involved. And so we aren't separated from reality by, by a cloud of concepts. We contact reality directly. 
So Kripke re replaces that sort of Russellian or postmodern picture with that. Yes. He smashes the glass. Okay. <laughs> There's no longer this window of concepts we have to look through. We can look directly at reality. We can talk about it directly. In fact, that reality is independent now of our concepts. It's independent of how we think and talk about it. It's not constructed in any sense by our concepts. Neither is our reference to it. There's an, a, direct, a direct and immediate connection between us and the world. Okay. So what is the obvious... <laughs> Target, you might say, of all of this. If you think in terms of philosophical parties, which party loses if you move to this sort of picture? The idealist party, right? I mean, that's really the enemy. He's trying to show you that idealism is wrong-headed, that there aren't concepts in between us and the world, that there is, in a sense, a given, that we can actually make direct connection to things in the world. Well, you might say, look, here's the big picture. The 19th century was the century of idealism, the century in which Hegel announced that the world was rational. What is rational is real, and what is real is rational. Why? Because it's all a construction of thought. And really, analytic philosophy was born in an act of rebellion against that. But even though it tried to distance itself from idealism, it just kept retaining the view that between us and the world is this wall of concepts. And we can see through it, kind of, but we're always seeing through it indirectly. Concepts are always intervening. And you can see how that pushes you eventually to something like a postmodern view, to an idealistic view, to something like Quine's view. And so it's really something that stayed with this entire movement all throughout the Anglo-American world until Kripke, where that began to break down. Russell, after all, as I've mentioned, thought we could refer to the world only by way of descriptions, and that meant concepts. Quine not only ex really extended the point, reference is not only indirect, but actually completely inscrutable. Am I talking about rabbits? Under that's rabbit parts, rabbit stages, rabbit hood. Ah, there's no fact of the matter. It's completely obscure what I'm actually referring to. But Kripke says, no. <laughs> I can refer to reality directly. If I'm talking about a particular rabbit, I can refer to that rabbit. I can call it bunny, or whatever name I choose to give it. And that rabbit then is something I'm picking out directly. It is not a question, really, of my having to settle <laughs> through the realm of concepts what it is I'm actually talking about. Now, that's true, he thinks, not only with proper names, but with natural kind terms, things like water, tiger. I'm referring to a kind of thing there, or a kind of chemical compound. and so. Here's the picture. The world consists of objects. <laughs> Those objects fall into natural kinds. Some of them are molecules of water. Some of them are tigers. Some of them are people, and so on. And no matter what we say, no matter how we think, that's the way the world is. The world consists of objects that are independent of our minds, independent of our thought. They fall into kinds that are independent of our minds and independent of our thinking. Yeah? If I name you Professor Bonnebeck, does that mean that, or just Bonnebeck, am I naming you as a person, or am I naming your being, and am I naming a collection of parts of a human being that all fit together? Ah, good. Kind of like a... Good, good, good. So, yes, the main sort of objection by people who are more sympathetic to this uh, <coughs> idealistic picture is to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Go back to, I mean, and you're talking about me, as, but I have to ask, are you my mother? <laughs> right? who, are you the one who's initially baptizing me, or is it something you inherit later? But let's imagine Nixon's parents baptizing him for the first time, Richard Milhouse Nixon. What are they naming? Imagine Quine being there at the baptism, and Quine saying, wait, I don't understand. Are you naming a person? Are you naming undetached person parts? <laughs> are you naming personhood, or an instance of personhood? Are you naming um, a particular stage? Now, actually, there is, that response would be then, I don't even know what you're doing until you specify something. So actually, a concept is required. I have to know whether you're talking about a person or an undetached person part, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes? So you said, uh, are you naming a stage? So could that apply to nicknames? How like, you acquire different ones as you go and they still find you? Uh, it could apply, yes. For example, when I was in junior high school, a good friend of mine nicknamed me Bono. <coughs> <laughs> kind of like the rock star. <laughs> and so I was known as Bono from like seventh through ninth grade. Um, and that name then died when I moved and, you know, I lost touch with those people and so on. Nobody at my new school named me, called me Bono. So that was like a temporary name for me that was, in effect, if you want to think of it this way, you might say, 
oh, that was the name of a stage of Dan Bonavac. That 7th through ninth grade stage. Um, I don't actually think of it that way. That was a name for me, right? And if I, the guy's name was Buddy Barrow who gave me that. If I saw Buddy Barrow today, presumably he'd say, Bono. And it would still be a name for me, right? He was trying to name the person. He wasn't thinking, I'm going to name this person from 7th to ninth grade, this, right? That person stage. Now, how can we tell? Well, he'd still call me that. And so if we ask Richard Nixon's parents, are you naming the person or the person stage? What do they call him tomorrow? Is his name still Richard Middlehouse Nixon? If they say yes, that's evidence that it's actually a person <laughs> and not a person stage. Come on, little buddy, don't die on me. <clears throat> I'll plug it in for a moment and see if it recharges. <laughs> this seems hopeless. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, so anyway, that, I think that is a, a, a legitimate objection and a hard objection to assess today. How do I know whether I'm referring to a person or a person stage or just a lump of molecules or whatever when I use Nixon? So the thought would be the act of baptism presupposes a concept. I think Kripke's response is, no, look, things do fall into natural kinds. And so we think of these acts of naming as picking out a thing of that natural kind. And the natural kind here is person, not person stage or undetached person part or something like that. Yeah, go ahead. Could it be when they give you the name that, are, that whenever you say the name self, that you are referring to self such that you would understand what you were saying if you were in pain without any perception of anything, such that everything you knew was possible already? So oh, whenever you say that, nice. it refers to your actual self. Right. That means that's what everyone else is referring to. Okay, good. That's a very interesting question. Imagine me in the sensory deprivation tank and I'm naming myself, right? I should be able to do that if Descartes' right. I think I am. I would like a name to call me. <laughs> and so I give myself a name in that setting, right? It's weird because I'm baptizing myself, but I realize I'm a person. I need a name for me. And so I call me Guido. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, when I do that... <laughs> You know, I'm naming something. What is that something? I might not yet actually have the concept of a person, right? All I have is really this concept of a consciousness, of the me. <laughs> and so, is it clear what I'm naming? Um, all the information we have about natural kinds, you might say, we're getting a posteriori. And so, do I have any idea what I'm actually referring to? Uh, suppose we find this person in the tank, and we're the jungle linguist, in this case, who is saying, well, Okay, he talks about Guido, referring to himself. What exactly does Guido refer to? A person? A mere consciousness? This, the soul? Um, the mind? Yeah, I, I think it might be hard for us to sort that out. And that, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I don't know how to answer that. A lot of questions you guys ask, I can think, ooh, there's a big literature on that. That one, there's not a big literature on I think that's a fascinating question. Okay, well, oh yeah, <laughs> is that a name or a description? <laughs> the University of Texas at Austin, that sounds like a description, right? There is, <laughs> there is one and only one University of Texas in Austin, and that's it. Um, it the Combs School of Business, that sounds like a name. Yeah, go ahead. The University of Texas is also a name, though. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, the mere fact that it has a the in it doesn't mean... So suppose I say, yeah, imagine a world where the University of Texas at Austin actually gets moved, right? In fact, we, we're opening up a branch in Dubai. The University of Texas at Austin at Dubai. <laughs> suppose eventually that grows and Austin, you know, dwindles and eventually people think, oh, the University of Texas at Austin. That's this Arab university in Dubai. <laughs> well, um, I guess it could be, right? which is a sign that it's a name and not a description, because we wouldn't want to say, in fact, if you think in terms of description, the one and only one University of Texas in Austin, in Dubai, that seems incoherent. Um, so you're probably right that it actually is these days used as a proper name, even though it might have started as a description. We started this university, it was in Texas. People said, huh, the University of Texas. And then it was like, oh, well, now there are a bunch of them. So we have to say the University of Texas at Austin for it to be a uniquely identifying description. But then we start thinking, well, we can have the University of Texas at Austin at Dubai. And then it's like, uh, yeah, now, now it doesn't make any sense as a description at all. Okay. Well, now, Kripke actually has used this to argue for some surprising conclusions. And here's one of them. 
He is reviving traditional metaphysics. For decades, people thought of talk of necessity and possibility and so on as, as just nonsense. But he revived more than that. Here we have this image of, well, a soul leaving a body before the train strikes. <laughs> now, by the way, that's a really clever artwork. It's really a superimposition of like three photographs, but I think it's very nicely done. Anyway, here's his idea. Identity statements are necessary. If Hesperus is phosphorus, i.e. Venus is viewed in the morning, Venus is viewed in the evening, then that's necessarily true. Necessarily, Cicero is Tully, the nickname for Marcus Tullius Cicero. Or necessarily, water is H2O, etc. Those are really necessary identities. And here's the picture. If we've got descriptions like the morning star and the evening star, they can vary across possible worlds in what they refer to. So if they happen to refer to the same thing in our world, well, no need for them to refer to the same thing in other worlds. However, if names are definite descriptions, then they pick out the same thing in every possible world. So if I name the morning star Phosphorus, for example, and the evening star, star Hesperus, then they're the same thing in this world, but they're the same thing in every world because they're both just names of Venus. Okay, Hesperus is Venus, let's say, and so Venus is the same thing in every possible world. So identity statements, if they're true at all, are necessarily true. Oh, there's Cicero, there's a water droplet, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, he uses this to argue in favor of dualism. Dualism is the view <laughs> that the mental and the physical differ in kind. Maybe they overlap. Let's leave that question unde undecided for the moment. But at any rate, there are two different kinds of things. There are mental things, there are physical things. There are mental properties. There are physical properties. This can take a number of different forms. Maybe there are mental events. There are physical events. These differ in kind, says the dualist. The materialist, of course, says, no, look, everything is really just matter. Everything is physical. And so the mental is really physical. So we can think of the mental and the physical as being in this kind of relationship. The mental is just a subset of the physical. Some physical events, like this, they're just physical events. There's nothing mental. But some of them are brain events. And those might turn out to be mental events as well. That's the materialist idea. The idealist reverses it. Actually, everything depends on the mind, so everything is ultimately mental. The physical is really mental. You think you're referring to a desk, but actually, it's just your idea of the desk, or your image of the desk, or something you can never really get outside your own mind. And then there is another possible view. It was Russell's view for a while. It's also, I think, the Buddhist view, ultimately. Neutral monism. The mental and the physical are, well, both of kind X, but we don't know what that is. <laughs> that was Russell's idea. Yeah, mind, body. It's not like the body is the mind, the mind isn't the body, but they're both something. I know not what. Okay. Now, <clears throat> here's Kripke's argument. You might imagine materialism is depending on certain mind-body relationships. For example, here's one from 1970s neuroscience. Pain is C-fiber firing. It's a particular kind of physical event in the brain. Okay, in the nervous system, there are certain fibers, C-fibers, that when they're stimulated, people experience pain. So that was the idea. There are going to be identi identities like that you could refer to. Well, he says, look. We can take Descartes' traditional argument and manipulate it a little bit to make it a better argument. Descartes had argued this way. It's possible for the mind to exist without the body. Or for that matter, for the body to exist without the mind. Therefore, the mind isn't identical to the body. The idea is this. The mind could exist without the body, but the body can't exist without the body. So they have different properties, right? The mind has this property of being something that could exist without the body. The body does not have that property, so they must be different. And the same thing here. The body could exist without the mind existing. Well, if that's true, then the body has a property the mind doesn't, namely being able to exist without the mind. <laughs> okay, so they can't be the same thing. Now, however you feel about that, let's see Kripke's variation. Suppose that P is a pain, and C is a brain state, a C fiber firing, for example, or whatever it might be, that you want to identify with that. Okay? Well, you might say, look, being a pain is essential to P. <laughs> it is necessarily felt as a pain. But it isn't essential to this C fiber firing, or whatever that neurophysiological event is. So the pain is not the same as that firing. It's not the same as that neurophysiological event. 
it has a property that the neurophysiological event doesn't, namely being essentially felt as a pain. So here's one way of thinking about this. Pain is mental. It's something we experience. It's essentially felt as a pain. But there are worlds in which C-fiber firings aren't felt as pain. So here is now the fancy modal part. This is why I talked about the possibility and necessity stuff. Yeah. There are worlds, right? There are possible worlds where pain isn't the same as C-fiber firing. We can say, yeah, look, a pain is always essentially, necessarily felt as a pain. But is a C-fiber firing essentially, necessarily felt as a pain? Maybe not. Maybe there's a possible world there where pain isn't C-fiber firing, right? And C-fiber firing isn't pain. But wait a minute. Identity statements are necessary. If pain is C-fiber firing in one world, it is in all of them. Or in other words, if there's even one world where it's not, then it isn't in any of them. Okay? Dang! <laughs> so, so that you don't get to see my pretty picture where now all of them get filled in with that non-identity. But that's really the idea. Okay? Now, how is it different from other things? Hilary Putnam talks about an example of twin earth involving water. Imagine that there's a world just like our world where we go and there's something that looks just like water, but then we do a chemical analysis of it and we find out that it is not H2O. It's something else. In the paper, he just calls it XYZ. It's something else. Now, is that stuff water? Are we in a world where water is not H2O? No. We're in a world where stuff that looks a lot like water is not H2O, right? But you go to that other planet, let's say, you come back, you say, I thought I had found water, but it turns out it's not water. It's X, Y, Z. Okay? It's not the same thing as water. That's what we would say. We wouldn't say, oh, we found out that water is in fact not H2O. It's just that there's this stuff that feels a lot like water. So suppose you had the same analysis of the pain case. We'd say, oh, yes, in this other possible world where people experience something like pain but without that neurophysiological state, we wouldn't say, there's a world where something really felt a lot like pain, but it turned out it wasn't pain. That's ridiculous, right? All it is to be a pain is to be felt as pain. <coughs> What's pain? That, okay? It's to be felt like that. <laughs> and it's not a question of any determinate sort of real essence of that thing underlying it that identifies it as pain. But with water, we think it does. Water is H2O, and if we find something that looks a lot like water and tastes a lot like water and smells a lot like water and so on and so forth, but is not H2O, it's not water. However, if we find that something feels a lot like pain, but it turns out it's not C-fiber firing, well then, gosh, it's still pain, right? <laughs> and so that, in fact, proves that pain is not C-fiber firing. Now, yeah, I've actually taken us to within three minutes of the end here, and we haven't talked about the history of the 70s at all. So we'll just do that next time, and I'll pause and ask, well, uh, yes, there's one slide I really wanted to show you. And I have to talk about, so we'll do it this way. We've been talking for much of the course about two-level theories that have this sort of structure. Right? Here's the manifest image. Here's the scientific image. And there are certain connections in between. And in particular, the way this has often been identified, this is the level of matter. This is the level of body, if you want to think of it that way. The mind is up here at this level. Well, the materialist, or in a different way, the idealist and so on, ends up saying, look, these are really identified. Right? There is some close relationship between the two of them. What is Kripke doing? He's breaking that apart. He's saying, no, they can't be identified. But that also means that the manifest image can't be identified with some manifestation of the scientific image. There can't be that kind of close connection. There's an independence to mind. So similarly, there's an independence of the manifest image. And so in terms of the course here, the significance of Kripke is in part that He's really saying, look, there's something wrong with that conception of a two-level theory. This level really does have an independence of that level that a lot of the theorists that we've been talking about deny. So the typical two-level theorist says, really, there is a kind of determination relationship here. Kripke's saying, no, things at this level can't be identified with things in power.